Hey guys, what is going on? It's Jay Campbell, the author of a bunch of books, and I'm joined today in my virtual studio, our studio, StreamYard studio, with two amazing people who really don't need introductions. On my right, closest to me, right, is Alexander Juan Antonio Cortez. Alex, how are you, brother? What's up, Jay? It's great to see you, man. You got the fucking amazing beard you're rocking. And then, of course, needing no introduction, my longtime friend. Mike Cernovich. Mike, what's up, brother? How you doing? Are we live right now? Is there a shareable link? We are live right now, and uh, there is a shareable link. Um, I will just Actually, if you just check the message that I just put out about 15 minutes ago, you can retweet it. Perfect. Um, it's weird. The StreamYard interface is amazing, and you can't – essentially, you can't retweet their link because they would get an invite into here. But the link is retweetable. All so right. you already have it. Um, and I, I just put the YouTube, but we are on my Twitter. You can attach me too. We're live on Twitter too. Okay, cool. Okay, here we go. So guys, today, Mike and Alex and I are going to kind of round table this. I'm really going to be the moderator. So we'll let these guys uh, put their prodigious brains into play. Um, obviously, the podcast goal is to help everybody who watches it uh, do great things in the 2020s, which all three of us believe are going to be amazing. And so, so the first topic is probably really the only negative topic I think we have today that we're going to discuss, and that is the all-out war on our biological systems, what you can do about it. So I'm going to go to you first, Mike. What can people actively do right now knowing they're literally being desecrated from literally every angle? Well, they don't I, because before when preparing for this um, conversation because I know that we, we have a lot to talk about. I was just thinking about what I, I'm, I found a term for it. I'm calling it the knowledge gap and it's like 20 or 30 years. And here's what I mean by that. A Alex and I are in a private membership group where the guys are a cut above the rest, you know, but they're, they're in there bashing TRT. And I'm just like, Oh my God. I mean, these are, you know, people who are above average spreading ignorance about testosterone replacement therapy and I realized people don't know anything. Um, it's, it's, it's just, it's worse. The, the level of question that I get today, I can't even answer them. I, that's why people are like, oh, why don't you go back to doing mindset? Or why don't you, why? So people can just ask me questions that I just cannot imagine. But, and I feel bad for them because they don't know anything. And I'm sure Alex can, can tell you too. They, people don't know. I don't know. They don't know anything. It's scary. It's really, really scary to say that. And before you go, Alex, the acceleration and, you know, Mike, you have two young daughters. I have two young daughters. Mine are a little bit older than Mike's. But guys, I mean, you know, I can attest to this. And Mike and I talk about this all the time. What they are teaching our children is nothing. The kids only learn by using devices. If there's critical thinking required, unless you're a very proactive parent, your children are not going to learn anything that is not something they can quickly access or research or again, search through Google, Alexa, or Siri. So there is a massive critical thinking skills gap that is, as you just mentioned, Mike, in the marketplace. But go ahead, um, Alex, your thoughts. Yeah, I, I always refer to this jokingly, but seriously, where I call it the bro tardation epidemic. Right. <coughs> where and I, I've seen this arise the last few years where the level of questions that I get from the younger guys and even the older men the level of question has fallen to the point where it's sort of this binary, do I do this or I do that, this immediacy of wanting an answer that's very simplistic. Um, yeah, and I think back to when I was in high school and we still had to research the level of like, you actually had to type stuff into Google and know how to put in a search query and phrase it properly. And even that's been lost. <laughs> so yeah, like I'm, I'm dead serious, it is, it is. Um, yeah, so for something like, you know, like TRT, like a lot of young guys, I, I, I get that message all the time. My, I'm 24. My testosterone levels are 300. They're 280. I don't know what to do. What would I have to look at? I'm like, all right, you're going to need to overhaul like a whole bunch of critical aspects of your life. Uh, you know, obviously it's a lot of work, but you have this whole generation of young guys today where, yeah, some of them are certainly ahead of the game, like a, a few select percentage, but everybody else is really just falling behind. So we live, yeah. we sort of live in like this paradoxical time period where it, it's the easiest, it, it's the easiest it's, it's ever been to get ahead. But if you're not ahead, you're, you know, it's basically, this, I want to say an abject failure, but you're non-competitive. You know, it's like, it's this, or it's this deviation of either you're up here, you're down here. There's there's no middle class of man anymore. You know, you're either, you're either top 20, 
or you're just forgotten. You're obsolete. Yeah, buy model. They they this happened in law and real estate with incomes. They call it buy model distribution of income. Where if you're a, a really good real estate agent, you're making five hundred thousand a year. You're making seven figures, or you're making thirty thousand. Yeah. Th it used to be right. like if you're a real estate agent, you a lot of them you could make eighty, ninety, hundred thousand dollars a year, and that was a, a pretty typical realistic range. And now you're either the top person or nobody. And it's becoming also that way with in terms of knowledge, because there's never been more knowledge. But I was trying to think of the root cause, like just why people are just so moronic. And, uh, you know, I was, I was taking out the trash last night and I was thinking about how as much as the bodybuilding magazines were propaganda, that was all we had. And there right. was enough truth in them that mm -hmm. if you just kind of read them and you lifted and, you know, you hit your workout, you would be OK and now these people, because they can talk back, they don't ever just read. They don't ever just pick up a copy of Muscle Media 2000 and be right. like, oh, here's a Charles Paulquin, you know, one day arm cure. Right. And then you do it and you're like, well, my arms didn't grow an inch and a half because I ate some yams in between, you know, Zercher curls or whatever. But, you know, they, 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 you know, they grew, you know, an eighth of an inch and I got a good pump and everything. And, and, and now it, because you just had to kind of read it and apply it to your life. Yeah. Um, let me, let me just say, so, so obviously I, I think it's very provable. You know, I have some smart guys in some of the groups that I'm into who are showing that now Google there's data out there. There's IQ data out there now that the United States has fallen <laughs> far behind China in the average intelligent quotient. And obviously we know that IQ is not just intellectual. There's also an emotional gradient, but whatever we are being dumbed down. And I think all three of us know it's due to technology. Technology makes things so simplified and so easy that most people today just want the fastest, most, you know, the easy button. They want the easy button for everything. So nobody wants to train. They don't want to eat right. They don't want to like go and, you know, wash their car. Nobody wants to do anything that requires physical effort. It's just like, how can I have the easiest path, you know, with the least resistance? So let me just say this, and then I'm going to go back at you guys and we're going to kill this point. Um, you know, Alex is really good on talking about how to optimize, and this is for men, but obviously it also applies to women on how to optimize your hormones naturally. Um, as I move away from Jay Campbell, I mean, TOT revolution to Jay Campbell, I'm not talking about TRT anymore. As Mike knows, it's a useless point at this point. If you don't understand how testosterone can help you, then, you know, God, God, right. God can you read a book? That, that, that's just right. I, I told you, book, you quit asking me, leave me alone, <laughs> right. go see a doctor, pay your $500, get your blood work, read a book, right. leave me alone. Well, we're going to, we will get to that at the end of the show about reading because most people don't read that probably is the biggest efficiency, but, uh, but again, naturally go do everything naturally first, right? We know that the air sucks. We know that the water supply is chemical infestation. We have GMO food. If you just go back to natural means, and again, Alex does a great job of talking about this, like 50 ways to increase your testosterone and your hormones, you know, naturally do those things. But this is where you have to go. You have to eat organic food. OK, stop eating shitty engineered food. It's that simple. Right. Again, I'm just very meta here, but do natural things. If God did not make it, don't eat it, you know, type similar points or, you know, that kind of things. But that's where we're going to go back to you, Mike. So, you know, just from a you know big picture standpoint, like what are three things that you recommend people to do to stop this attack that is happening to them? That That's why I mentioned earlier, the, the hardest thing anymore is people are just not waking up yeah. and that that's the step one is just the sheer level of ignorance on fundamental issues of life are are there, and most people they're they're not even waking up. So the number one thing I, I notice this too when, when you ever whenever you talk about anything, just how people you know like with vaccines, I always tell people I'm pro vax but if you look into it, you know you're just you, you ask questions. You just ask a question here or there. And people are like, do, 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 do. you want people to die of polio? And you're like, oh, man, you don't even know. You don't have kids. You don't even. Like, what? So so number one is quit having an opinion on everything. If you don't have kids and you're like 22, you do not know anything about vaccines no, at all. You know, or even yesterday there was a guy kind of trolling saying, you know, how did the dinosaurs get so big? And people want to like argue. I've looked into it. There's a lot of theories. And the answer is you just have an opinion. 
somebody tells you that there was the atmosphere was different, there was a higher oxygen content, the dinosaur's bones were hollowed out and everything. <laughs> but and the reason I bring that up is because not that I'm a dinosaur denier, but why do people have to have an opinion on everything? If you ask me, were dinosaurs real? I'm like, well, I mean, I think so. You know, probably they were. I, th I think they were, but I'm not going to get wound up or angry if you disagree because in what world, you know, am I a paleontologist or something like that? So there would be one would just be you don't have to have an opinion on everything um, or most things. I have an opinion on almost nothing. And then two is, though, if you are going to have an opinion, then you need to seek out the real information and then you'll realize how most of what you're told is an out and out right, right lie, societal lie on every aspect. You're everything from, you know, oh, TRT is bad. I'm like, this is like 30 years ago. Or even I'll see people argue about martial arts. I'm like, UFC was 1993, bro. Right. You, you want to argue Hapkido or, or you can't. This was like I the I go there. <laughs> just travel back in time for, for re, three decades ago because you're not you're not even you're not even the 90s on all this kind of information. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Just a couple things, two or three things. What people can do right now to avoid the attack on their biological systems. I mean, I, I always say it starts with awareness, and you can't. You can't forcibly wake people up either. Either, no. you, either you have either you have self awareness or you don't. Like you talk about, you know, being high conscious, low conscious. Majority of people are low conscious. Yes. If you're high conscious, then you're going to have to accept accountability for those aspects of your life which you can control, and that's going to be your health, your body, and what you consume. You know, and then consumption on the level of information to obviously food to this whatever you expose yourself to. If you do that, you have something of a fighting chance. You can certainly you know, kind of engineer like a good bubble to live in. Like I, I live in a bubble. Like I, with, with what I, people I'm around, you know, what I do and don't do, I don't have to put up with a lot of bullshit the average person has to put right. up with or just endure. Right. right. You have to engineer your own bubble. Um, you know, whether you want to call it the community, or whatever, like it has to happen. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you don't do that, you're just going to be at the mercy of fucking whatever arises. And you know, probably the, probably the best thing I think I've told people the last few years is like, a, it's like a tale of, um, you know, point of like, what's Lindy. If something's been proven out and it's been working for, 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, and it's been done for forever, that's probably a useful thing to do, and you don't know the reason why. You know, the, this this epidemic, and I've seen this in fitness and just the world at large, like everything being new and improved from oh. fucking devices to health information to how you're supposed to eat, and, you know, nothing has any track record, and it's all hypothetical, the suppositional, the um, theoretical, and, and, all, and all the authority behind it comes from, you know, the powers that be, so to speak. Well, they're, they're told to do this. This is what they say. I'm like, you're, you're fucked if you live that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I can, I can show you a better way of being thinking more self-awareness, but I can't put, you can't obviously pull people out of that. Right. I think that's the best answer before we jump into the next point, which I know you guys are going to have a lot of comments on a self-awareness. You know, the, the spec ops guys will all say that it's all about situational awareness. Do you have situational awareness? And we are now in a time and an age where we are being attacked literally from every angle. So as these guys say, if you're not situationally aware and you're not willing to do the work after, then you're going to get what comes to you. So I'll start with this one. I'll go back again with you guys. So how building muscle is the greatest equalizer, both physically and psychologically. Now, obviously, all three of us have written prolifically and spoken prolifically about muscle biologically being like the you know key deterrent or resistor to aging. The more muscle you a person has, the more insulin resistant they are, the more metabolically active they are. And obviously, as Alex is great about speaking, the more functional they have. It's a gravity issue, right? If you're muscular, you can actually resist the age or the timing of aging and your bones becoming decrepit and you're losing, you know, muscle density and all those things. So I'll just say that the building muscle also psychologically, as Alex always writes about, and Mike started writing about 15 years ago, literally creates men and women who are strong and resistant to the nonsense that is now created by our mainstream culture. When you are physically strong, you are also physically and aware and you're hyper-focused on like making a better wife. I'm going back to you, Alex, your thoughts on what, why muscle is so important. Yeah. I was thinking about this recently and one of the, one of the great advantages of bro science and bro science gets shit on now, you know, despite most of it really just being true, but when you lift and you, you get yourself physically stronger, it teaches you applied knowledge. You see very practically what works and what doesn't. And then you realize how much of life is 
theoretical bullshit. You know, when you are doing something where the outcome is so physically obvious to you and it manifests itself through a stronger body, through larger muscles, through lifting more weight, you can start applying that filter to everything and you'll realize a lot of things don't measure up. They don't pass the bullshit test. Uh, but yeah, and there's, and there's also, of course, the psychological aspect where, I mean, it's very cliche to say, but as a man, what's the most fundamental basic virtue that you can possess? Being physically strong. If you're physically strong, you're probably more competent, more useful, hard to kill. You can do things that weaker men can't do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could, yeah, it's arbitrary to say a percentage, but probably 80% of men's self-improvement is literally just, just lift weights. That That's half the battle. If you do that, everything from how people perceive you, yourself, your self, self-confidence, it all changes. It changes all these relationships everywhere. There's no doubt about that. You know, Mike and I were talking about that literally a decade ago, that you teach a man how to lift weights and he consistently shows up for one year. His entire world changes. The way people take him, you know, the way he, you know, takes other people. Go ahead, Mike, your thoughts. There, there's a lot going on with that. And you see it more and more in society where it's, I don't know, like I've, I'm reaching a point where it's just incomprehensible to me that every man doesn't lift weights who is physically, it's just, it, it's at the point now, it's just incomprehensible to me where like, okay, you don't want thicker, stronger bone mass. Right. Well, if you get in a car crash, that that's yeah. going to help you out. You're just every function of your life is based on some kind of physical presence. People who lift weights just have less time for the societal BS. It, it makes you organize your week better because you don't want to have a hangover because you don't want to miss your workout. Right. There, there, it literally changes every aspect of your life. You you don't want to be around people who are kind of you know, losers or whatever, the more, the, the issue is the, the more that you invest in yourself and the harder you work, the less problems you have with people organically because you just don't have time. People go, Oh Mike, I'm dating this girl and she did blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, if you were worth a damn, you would just have no time for that. You would just say, I don't have time for this, man. I'm working on businesses. I got to go to the gym. I'm reading, I'm studying, I'm thinking about the world. I don't have any time for your like nonsense. And if, but if you're not putting any um, work into yourself, then you're this, it, the theory is it, it's kind of like embodying consciousness and everybody who's seen their body go through different changes can attest to this. So like, you know, this Jay, even like when you lean out, if you look at something, a shirt, it just looks bigger than it was before, even though it's the same shirt, your perception changes. Or if you're, you're gaining weight, the, you know, the under armor shorts you would wear look smaller. Right now, they haven't changed, but perceptually, your entire view of the world changes because our consciousness is embodied in our minds and our body. And when you're just hitting it and killing it, and people say things to you, you're you're just like, I, I don't even have time. I don't even want to talk to you. And and that naturally, or or even the same thing. Like a lot of people haven't noticed this because my body, you know, you've gone. Um, when you get leaner, you're attracted to leaner women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not through any kind of conscious process. Right. It's and evolutionary when, biology. Yeah. 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 And then when your physical standards have become lower, you'll be attracted to people that you never would have looked at a year ago. And all of this is happening at unconscious level. Yeah. You're not saying to yourself, oh, I'm going to be attracted to a different type of person or, oh, this object, object looks larger or smaller. Your perception of the world literally changes. And that's something that if people haven't put the work in themselves, will never realize. Very, very well said. So this point real quick, we're just going to all hammer this down real quick because it comes right after building muscle. And you guys know that we live in a world of scientism. Like all these young people today will say, you got to study for that, right? Like everybody wants to debate and prove that like, well, it has to be verified by the realm of science. So biochemical individuality, again, Mike and I were talking about this a long time ago. Alex just wrote an amazing email the other day about N of one. Guys, it's this simple. Every single one of us is going to respond differently. The only way you're ever going to know about anything is to do the fucking work. That's the only way. You don't know if you use this supplement, you're going to get results. If Mike does a keto diet, if Alex does a, you know, a higher carb diet, you're not going to know until you do it yourself. Alex, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, with N equals one, I, I've said this before when I was like in, in the fitness industry more and people never really quite grasped it since fitness industry is idiots, but 
most of what most science that has been done throughout human history up until you could probably argue the 1940s, it would never pass the gold standard double blind study clinical evidence. It would n- none of it, none of it. Most of the innovations in medicine right. came before any of that even existed. Yeah, and especially for training, guys have been getting big and strong since I mean, re- dawn of record history, progressive overload, right. Milo's a croton, you know, carrying the bull on his shoulders. Like we know what works, and we don't need signs really to tell us that it works. You know, it can show us the mechanisms underneath it. But otherwise, I mean, like guys in 19, you know, tens, 20s, you can go back in every decade, you can see amazing physiques, amazing bodies, men who are way more capable, fitter than anyone today, you know, even oh, yeah. modern bodybuilders. And they figured it all themselves just by experimentation, trial and error. And the truth of biology reveals itself. Um, and everybody's a bit different. Like everyone's a little bit different. So you can certainly find patterns and certain principles that always apply. But you know, the experimentation process, that's wholly unique. If, if, if your metric for being able to make a fucking decision is you need, <laughs> you need a study, you know, like, well, I can't do that. But there's, what's the evidence for it? The evidence for it is it's very broish, but like the evidence is that there's been 50 years of bigger, stronger bros than you that right. fucking did it exactly. and it worked for them. So why not try it? Oh, uh, but these people are the issue is these people aren't going to change their behavior based on a study. That's one I, I become very intolerant in my life. And I think I actually started kind of a trend on Twitter, which is good. Is I just don't argue. If you mm-hmm. post an argument, right. I block you. And they're like, yep. oh, you're afraid of questions. <laughs> Bro, I've gone to the White House and put the entire White House press corps on blast. You're some insignificant, nothing afraid of a qu- I've gone in 60 minutes. I've gone to, you know, every kind of lion's den that you can imagine. Oh yeah. I'm so afraid of some um, geek asking me for a source. So if you, if you reply to me, if I say something, you got a source for that question mark blocked instantaneously <laughs> because you could show them the source and they're not going to say, Oh, okay. Well, this is like, there's heart disease studies that say TRT is bad for you. Right. Or you're going to get prostate cancer. Like, well, I, I debunked those 10 years ago. You know, they're widely debunked. Their mm-hmm. their hormonal dosages are spaced out 14 days. They're right. not optimizing with test, testosterone propanate. So I'm like, okay, you don't even know what an asterisk attached to testosterone <laughs> molecules, a delivery system. So you have you, you don't even know how to read these things. So I just, and, and that really shows too, though, how the people who want to level up are living like gods, really. Yeah. Mm, Not to be exactly. blasphemous, would you say emperors? I, yeah. I'll always say that if you really level up, you live like a Roman emperor. You live like royalty. You make money. You can go meet any kind of hot girl that would never be attracted to you. You are, are not attracted, but you never have access to. You right. can date five different hot women, and they kind of know like that's just kind of how it is now because most guys are so pathetic that you you know you just got to kind of that you know the dating is on on different terms that's what guys are like oh i can't get women to stay around i'm like well then you're just a loser bro uh, a fact when i was dating i was like i can't you know i'm trying to break up with these people they won't let me break up with them and i don't know how to handle like how do you handle it when you're like okay we're broken up and they're just like no we're not broken up i'm like no 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 like i don't that's why i was like laugh of these dating people Nobody ever wrote about that. Like, what's mm-hmm. how do you break up with the person who's just like, no, we're not broke, bro- breaking up. No, that, 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 that's, like, that's the real red know. pill. That, that's the real, the, the real red pill isn't getting women, it's getting rid of women. Yeah. Yeah. You're just like, like I want to go our own ways. And they're just like, no, you can't. And you're like, okay, this is a little strange. This is new territory. Whereas most people, though, they don't have a shop. But the flip side is, I don't have sympathy for them. And this kind of relates back to like an actionable thing that you know is more positive or aspirational is just find somebody and listen to what they tell you to do and just shut up just shut the you know fuck yeah. up do what you're told for about a year right and then see where you are and if it sucks okay ask for your money back or whatever or, you know never buy that guy's ebooks or you know whatever the case is and, and just shut up but that's not what they want to do you know but but if you did it that way because fundamentally that's what we did <clears throat> you read you know, Arnold is such a dork right now that you wouldn't believe it, but you read education of a bodybuilder when you're like in college and you're like, okay, this is the blueprint. Like right. this is, this, this still is, is it. it still is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember doing that routine from that book and it was, yeah, it was like six days a week and it's double workouts. But yeah, I think about that now. Mike, you said something years ago, Mike, where if you, if you have an audience that argues with you, you got a shitty audience. I've always remembered right. that since I, I don't argue with anybody ever about anything. Right. It's just not worth it. It's, no, it's not worth it. it. 
I mean, we've all had that where we, you know, descended into the madness of the hordes, but we don't do that anymore. Obviously, and it goes right into the last point, but just something to what Mike just said, I wanted to just add. The problem, Mike, as you know, is what you said is brilliant, but instead of just listening to that one source or, you know, authority figure and then doing the work, they get distracted because they go on the internet and they read the nonsense, as you guys know, that is everywhere. I mean, what do you guys think? You know, I'll just real quick, this rabbit hole. What do you think the percentage of information that's found online today is even legit? Like 10%? Um, <laughs> okay. Totally. So um, I would say not even, I would say maybe uh, half a percentage, right. maybe one. Because every time, every time I've learned something, I'm like, okay, these people are just like, I call them like e-commerce Twitter. I just block. Anytime that stuff gets retweeted, I just block the the account because you're just like, no, this is actually not how it works. You're all lying. Mm. They're like, oh yeah, I'm running this drop drop shipping store in Chiang Mai. I'm like, okay, I live in Chiang Mai. I know how you people live. It's great, you know. You live a nice life off two thousand dollars a month, right. and I fully support that. By the way, right. I think that most men are like, why would you live a mediocre life in America on fifty thousand dollars a year? Find out how to make three or four grand a month. And go live in Chiang Mai Absolutely. for like three years, and that'll right. completely change your your dynamic. But but don't go on Twitter and act like you're making a hundred thousand a month, because I know what that looks like, right? I know, <laughs> you know I know what a hundred thousand a month looks like, and you're not making a hundred. You're not even making ten thousand a month. They're just you're not you know sleeping in squalor. You're making a hundred thousand. Yeah. Oh, I just want to save my money. No, you don't. You're just you're, you're lying. Yeah. And, and the the key though is just like find. Like I'll give an example. So if you want to learn click funnels, the CEO and founder of click funnels has a podcast on click funnels exactly. where he tells you everything. So why would you go learn click funnels from somebody else from some e-commerce Twitter bro? Oh yeah. Here's how I said, why don't the, the guy who made click funnels has a thing on it. Why don't you just like my course is 80% off. It's 1999 one time right now. If you buy it by midnight, January. 4th. Yeah. So, and if I wanted to learn TRT, I would just go to Jay Campbell and I would just, Look at Jay. It's like Jay Campbell's 45. He oh doesn't look 45. God, it's free, too. It's free. Yeah. He's got a few books. There's a few yeah, books by about TRT. Court has his arm program. 40 bucks. You buy a new program every three months. Yeah, that is nothing. That's $15 a month. It's it took to look better. And then, oh, I saw this guy on YouTube says this. Well, you know, okay. Then you got to get in that whole argue with people that, oh, they're all natty. I'm like, By the way, that's the whole thing. point, Mike. I, mean, we're, I don't think we'll hit it today, but YouTube culture is a point because imagine the influence that YouTube has on people, not just from shitty information, but just literally with dopaminergic signaling pathways in the brain. I mean, people get into this YouTube spiral or loop and they can't do anything. I saw well, they can't. Well, that's the thing that they don't. What I what I learned though is, and that's why I'm glad you guys are balancing me out. You guys are making me feel like I've joined the dark side now because you guys are a little more optimistic than me. Is my answer to that is they just don't want to. They they're right. just sitting there trying to get that like next next dopamine hit or whatever. Like I remember when I was kind of you know single again. You know you have it like how do you go for a first kiss or something? So I would go on the internet like yeah. I mean if you haven't dated for five years, the, the world has changed a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, and and then you're like, oh, okay, that's a good little tip. Go ahead and apply. I don't need to watch how to make out with girl videos for twenty or thirty hours. It's just kind of like, oh, you know, here's like the dating scenario. It's a little weird. People are using these things called apps. Um, if you have a good body, take a selfie or your hot body and yeah. post it. And you're, and you know, okay, cool. So if you're if you're spending you know thousands of hours watching YouTube videos for anything other than entertainment. Because right. I like the entertainment factor. I think the yeah. training footage is good. The production value is so good. You know, Cali Muscle will be beefing with, you know, this other guy. You know, the Rich Piana, <laughs> one of the greatest men to have ever lived. You know, so I, I love it. It's the greatest. It's reality TV for men. But I'm not even going to watch Cali Muscle, who's completely natural, by the way. You know, just just eats a lot of tuna fish and ramen and, and instant coffee. <laughs> I'm just going to watch them because it's good TV. It's, it's, it's yeah. fun and you're winding down a little bit. But you're, the, the people who are watching that are not actually trying to get training tips. Awesome comment. So I'm just going to jump into the next point. And Alex, I'm going to go to you. And no. I think this is probably the best point we can make in the entire show because all three of us are living proof of this adage. And that is how reality creation is possible. Why being positive matters. Your thoughts. You know, there's a there's a quote I always like that life is engineered. 
and it, it was there's it a friend of mine. He, we actually we share the same birthday. But he had a very rough upbringing, and he yeah he re remade his life, changed his life, however you want to say it. But yeah, well, it's it's a it's a sort of this this paradoxical situation, as like like to always say that you have. You have the sort of the modern matrix. That if you're unaware and you're low conscious, it controls you. Right. At the same time, though, at the same time, that matrix, you have access to all the same tools that the, uh, let's just say, like the elites do. Yeah. You can control the feed information that you can get. You have the same marketing tools. You have the same internet tools. You have the same abilities to create a life for yourself, you know, both in digital world and physical world. All yeah. that's available to you. So the level of, you can, of control that you can exert over your reality, it's almost total. Yeah, there's certain things you can't change. You know, truly, you know, you're not going to change human nature, but you can pick where you live. You can pick where you work. You can, you can really decide everything if you, you know, if you really want to. If you really want to. So, I mean, if you account for all that, like you have a, you have immense power, or at least the potential for it. Yeah, at, at your fingertips. So this becomes a question of are you going to take advantage of it or not? Yeah, my life is throughout my 20s was a little bit up and down, and sideways, back and forth. But I had that moment three years ago, roughly, where I realized, you know what, if I want to make X amount of money and live in X place and afford X things, is there anything truly that is stopping me, you know, beyond the obstacle of the self? No, there's not. There, there really, there's nothing. It's just, it's either, this is going to be, you know, me and my bullshit. So, you know, once that sort of egoic obstacles out of the way, life just took off in this very, honestly, just very linear upward tra trajectory. That's awesome. Mike, before you go, I wanted to set, I want to set both of us up. So if I go back literally 11 years, 10 to 11 years, both Mike and I had divorces. Mm. I would say mine was probably a little worse than Mike's just for what happened to me. I went to jail, lost my kids, blah, 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 blah all that shit. But literally Mike and I are total 100% proof positive that you can literally come from nowhere to build the life of your dreams. I mean, again, and Mike rose much faster than I did, but you know, I just, I wanted to set that up. I mean, again, if people knew me and Mike and went back, you know, 10 to 11 years and Mike and I have been friends for more than 20 years for all you Twitter, Twitter and social media people shit, Mike longer than that. We have engineered our lives. So go ahead, Mike, talk about it. Yeah. A lot of it is. So a lot of it is deep mindset work because most people believe that, the past is the future and I'm just a blank. You, you run into this all the time. And I always tell people, unless you're on the sex offender registry list for like child crimes or whatever, you can, it doesn't matter what you did right. in the past, but everybody thinks that because everybody thinks in that Newtonian physics method of, well, I did these five things. So therefore I'm this, and therefore this is my future destiny instead of uh, a pivot or, you know, as, as you call it in Silicon Valley, they call it the pivot. Mm. Other people call it reinventing yourself. The, the fundamental philosophy is the same where me, I was a lawyer, decided I wanted to, you know, be a mind, mindset writer. How did I do that? I just, cause, cause I did, I, yeah. I, you know, they just tell people that they're like, well, now you just shall. Um, so then when I did that, they're like, oh, you're people are like, oh, you weren't qualified to write the book. I'm like, well, okay. Book did great. <laughs> And now then I was like, well, I want to, you know, get kind of into politics, get into media, you know, political commentary, broke some of the biggest stories of the year. Like, oh, you're just a shitty self-help book author. Then, So they're always with what, what I find what people try to do. And I really prepared for this podcast, guys. So we can go on as long as you want. I really prepared because I was just thinking that I think what differentiates us and, you know, me and others, especially what I teach from other people is that. I don't care, like, I don't care what you did in the past, you know, again, unless you're like a predator or something like that. Like, I don't care that you had a bad childhood, but you care. And then you think I can't go forward because of my childhood, my parents were this, my parents were that, blah, blah, blah. When really you just have to reinvent yourself, but you fundamentally, most people don't have this belief that you can just change your trajectory. Well, how do you do it? Well, it's better to just say, how do you, how do you not do it? Because uh, what what mm. is funny to me is uh, Jason Helms actually um, had a good tweet where he said, in 2010, I was a 300-pound sixth grade teacher. And in 2020, I'm a fitness entrepreneur with a six-pack living independently. People, and this is a quote, I think, maybe from Warren Buffett or something, but people overestimate what you can do in a year, but underestimate in 10 years. Right. People like, oh, I'm going to lose 40. People say like, for example, keep it very basic. I'm going to lose 20 pounds. Well, if you think you need to lose 20 pounds, 
you actually need to lose 40 or 50. Right. There, there's like that metric of, you know, you probably need 40 or 50 and it'll probably take you three years. What? No, no, I want to, no, it's probably going to take you three years. You have a life to live. You're going to have business lunches. You're going to have ups and downs, but you know, three years with 50 pounds of fat, you wouldn't even recognize yourself. Right. But, but if you, but if somebody in their own mind thinks that, cause they think recreation is some, a 12 week program. Right, right, right. right. Well, the, the, internet, the internet teaches everybody. It's a program. Yeah. It costs money for 90 days. Right, exactly. Yeah, I always tell people, you know, if you don't want to give me three years of your life, then I can't really help you all that much. Now, granted, at the end of three years, if you have to lose 50 pounds, you'll, you know, when you've lost 40 in two years, you're going to look and feel so much better and everything right. else. Right. But you you have to just start off with, yeah, you can reinvent yourself, but it, it you know, it does take a long time and, and often years. But the flip side is what the hell else are you going to do with your life? Right. Right. And and, and and very well said. And I'll just add, um, you know, and Alex does a really good job talking about this. It's literally tomorrow is a new day. Every single day the sun comes up. You have to have a mindset that no matter how low you are, you know, I've, I've been reading a lot of posts from people in the last you know, couple of days that they said, you know, 2019 was a real struggle for me, but I'm really excited about 2020 because the opportunity for me to do whatever I want there. And so it really, as Mike said, it comes down to a mindset. You know, are you willing to pivot, to change your focus, to look at things from a positive side, you know, we didn't talk about that in this in this you know conversation with your brilliant points. But again, it's so simple to look at things positively, because, again, the laws of the quantum prove again and again that you get what you focus on. So why in the hell would you ever focus on negativity? Why are you thinking about being a victim? Why are you thinking about the world owes you something or any of those things? Again, just focus on what you can contribute how you can serve and how you can, you know, be a good human being from a positive angle, doing those things. And you are absolutely positively going to manifest a better reality. I mean, it's literally that simple. All right. Let's the next one here real quick. So um, simple, not easy though. The, so, I, that's uh, you, a lot of people have so much of life is habit and patterns. I, I, I'll let me give an example where, you are often having children makes you mindful of your patterns in a way that you don't if you're single or before yep. you have kids. So for example, I would go to the fridge and grab like a piece of chocolate. Now it's the 85% dark chocolate. So there's ways to rationalize it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, but, <laughs> and then Cyrus so like, dad, can I have some? And I'm like, well, no. And then the answer is, well, if she can't have it, why should I have it? Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. And then I didn't even realize how mindlessly I was just going and doing it. Because you just kind of get up, especially if you work from home, you just sort of get up, right. you walk to the fridge when you're kind of hungry or whatever. And then so people have, and this is where a coach, a good coach can come in is just, or you can self-coach. If you want to self-coach, I call it just do a time at it. Literally write down everything you do. Woke up, got mad, right. looked at internet, whatever, completely authentic, right. and then just have a time log and then go through and start looking at habits because everybody, myself included, you have habits that become so much of a part of your routine. Like me, for example, if I would wake up to piss at three in the morning, I'd be on my phone. Now this is addiction. You know, that that's addiction. And so I was like, okay, no more of this. Right. So then, you know, or, or wear blue blockers or something, but most of the time we're not even aware of this ingrained behaviors because, you know, Pav, Pav, remember the uh, Pavel Tatsini or whatever, it always talk about greasing yeah. the groove for, for like, you know, how to do a hundred pushups at once. Uh, and you think about it, you grease the groove with bad habits too. And then it becomes so automatic and autonomous that you aren't even aware that you have these habits. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. Um, okay. So this is one, one that I know that you guys are also focused on, like with me. I mean, obviously I'm a little bit more vocal about it, kind of woo woo, but uh, you know, moving forward into 2020 and Mike, you know, wrote, wrote a really awesome uh, post about it before about the energetic shift, but you know, the reality is, and you know, Alex has been talking about it already in this podcast, but the reality is, is that that's what matters right now is raising human consciousness. And if you're not familiar with, you know, Dr. David Hawkins, he has an awesome scale of human consciousness. Um, it's very simple. 500 is the level of love. And what does love mean? It's not the woo woo new age, going to love people, you know, hippie stuff. It's, it's basically having a reverent respect for life, for animals, 
for humans, for everyone, where you treat everyone equally. And again, I don't want to make this woo-woo. I want people, especially in the social media world, to understand how important it is to get enough of us, because as Alex has already said, the majority of the world is low conscious, okay? And to define that, it's a number. It's 200 on the on the Hawkins scale. And 200 is the line of integrity. If you're below 200, then you're basically worthless. You do not contribute and serve all of us from a greater, you know, serving capacity. So we want to get everybody to 450, 500, which is the line of reason, light, love, whatever. And when we do that, guys, all of this nonsense, the political nonsense, the fighting, the war, the violence, all that shit is not going to matter because nobody's going to give a shit anymore. And that's essentially how the elites, as Alex mentioned to really control a large portion of society. They don't control us, but they control people who are easily emotionally distracted. You know, as Mike always wrote in his book, can you control your state? Can you keep yourself level emotionally when everything else bad is going on around you? Because that is a master, you know, in physical form. So the reality is, is we got to get enough people. Let's say right now, Hawkins says 15% of humanity is conscious. The rest is not if we can get that 15% to 20 and 20 to 25, and I think that's really it because all the great teachers have talked about that. As you guys know, the Pareto principle, you know, 20% of conscious people will probably raise all of the low conscious ships in the harbor. It's literally that simple. So if we can just get a little bit of an uptick from where we are, I think everything changes. Uh, your thoughts, Mike. Well, energetic, this is happening more and more too, is when you feel the energy of the world. And uh, fortunately, I have the freedom to write about these things now. I started no noticing this sort of years and years and years ago. When you start to feel the energy of the world in a way that you access from inside yourself, whether that's your pineal gland or the, the, bio, the biology of it, I don't really know then you are able to, to make things happen that are strange. You'll, you'll, you'll think about something and then that thing will happen right away in a way that's not confirmation bias because I'm aware of confirmation bias. We see patterns that aren't real, et cetera, et cetera. But just truly bizarre manifestations of your energy and in your will happen. And then you start to redirect it. I, I tell people best video that I saw recently you know, I saw two years ago, but I I shared it again recently. Was the uh, babies under a certain age they only see theta, they uh, theta waves, and I would tell people if you think energy waves are are not real, if you when you have a child and all you do is think I'm I'm expressing positive theta waves, energetic vibration, the child will change Absolutely. instantly, Absolutely. which just energetically, and that's also true of when you're connecting to other people. And then when you realize that when you're connecting to other people, you're you're connecting to nodes in the, into the collective consciousness, yes. or you're you're connecting to nodes in the hive mind, then you're that's how your energy gets through all of the world. So whenever I I write or something, and you know this if you're a writer, every writer knows this. Your uh, a soulless writer just types words, but when your heart is really into it, right. you're you're just like <laughs> you you physically just for something like writing completely changes and and then you're taking your energy that's why people say oh does art have soul people know all this energy stuff is real that's what craps me up. people are like oh energy dude like you all know it's real you're like I've, I've i saw that piece of music and it moved me why do you think it moved you because a piece of the the soul or the energy of the creator was instilled in that and then you're connecting to that energy when you engage with that piece of work hey mike i want to just give you an update and that we're not going to rabbit hole because Alex is going to go. This just happened. The United States government loses landmark vaccination lawsuit. This now can be legally cited by all those who seek compensation for vaccine injury, making it likely that the pharmaceutical vaccine industry can in the very near future be legally bankrupted out of existence. This just broke literally 30 seconds ago. Okay. Go, ahead, Alex. go ahead, Alex. Where are you going, Alex, by the way? Where are you going, Alex? That, that's interesting. That's right. No, 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 go ahead. No, I'm just saying, no, I'm just saying, go ahead, go f finish Mike's point. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the subject of energy, yeah, I, I, t I, I try to make things as pragmatic as possible for people, but what you realize when you study the, you study the body and you try to I say the body on deep levels that everything 
is kinetic on a certain level, but kinetic in a way that you, you can't see. The majority of the spectrum of what exists is not available to us, and our, our senses are very, very limited that way, extremely exactly. limited. Exactly. You know, and even things, you know, with biology that we think are simple, we can see it happen, but the actual mechanisms of how it interacts, it's it's energetic. Everything is fundamentally energetic. Energetic. Um, yeah, the, the example I have, I've, I've used oftentimes is, you know, something like, you know, like, like let's say it's like a sexual situation. You know, what gets somebody turned on? You know, because being turned on, it's not, it's not mechanical, it's emotional, it's psychological. So it's a feeling. Well, how, how do you how do you qualify and quantify a feeling? You really can't quantify feelings. You just experience them. You know, and most of what existed today in the state of is quantum physics or sort of quantum biology is that everything has a certain level of consciousness to it. So, you know, so everything that we know that exists interacts with its environment on a level of energy. And we know that. And you've seen, and I, we've all seen that the last few years with sort of the, like the, the divergence of the two movie theories. You have people that believe in a positive aspirational future, and you have people that truly firmly believe that the world is going to hell and they are besieged by enemies. And they live in a state of chaos and, and uh, you know frantic sort of uh, anxiety, and you can see how much they suffer and how miserable they are, and then that gets projected, and, and then your projections become sort of the theater that you look for, yeah. And for most people, their lives are not that significant to them, so it's better to involve themselves in things that reflect their own negative emotional states, which is you know, the political shit and the partisan stuff, or or just this, the, the arguments on the line that where we bicker every day. Yeah, we, 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 we fear this future years ago that we'd all become sort of like wired into the matrix and become sort of like enslaved by, like it would literally you know be attached to us. That's already really happened. You know, in a way, the technology was more advanced. We don't need physical devices. We don't need to be literally plugged in. We've done it to ourselves. People right. have done it to themselves. Right. Um, and their realities become very reflective of that. You know, but if you, if you want to change your energy, it, it does, you know, it sounds, what would you say, but it starts with self-love. Do you do you believe your life is significant and meaningful? Do you believe that you can do something that you can have an existence that's personally gratifying to you and you can find joy in it and it's exciting? It, you, can you believe that? Can you think that? Yeah, you know, or are you stuck in this idea that the past is prologue? If the past is prologue, then energy never changes. It just keeps repeating itself. Alex, that's so profound. I have to stop you on that. I want to talk about that. I know all three of us can talk about this. What you just said was the best point that could be made possible. And that is self-love. And when you don't have love of self and trust of self, and Mike and I have talked about this for 20 years, and there was a time in my life, I definitely did not trust and love myself. And Mike knows, and Mike helped me in a very low point in my life. But most people, until they can establish a love and trust of self, are going to be in fear, right? And when you're in fear, you are paralyzed from contributing, serving, quote unquote, doing the right thing, because you're always apprehensive of your choices and your decisions. And again, you guys know just on social media, the passive aggressive nature of men who live in fear, we can't even deal with it. And they can't even help themselves because they're re they refuse to take risks. They refuse to just take a chance, you know, to do something, quote unquote, out of the norm. And as you guys know, the gift of life in this physical form is to be in contrast and to embrace the contrast every single day, no matter how great your life is. You're making $100,000 a month. You have all these income streams, which we'll talk about. You still have ups and downs. Your kid is still going to get beat up on the playground. Something is going to happen that you have no control over. And it's like when you do not have fear in your life and you love and trust yourself, it doesn't matter because you'll just take it all in stride. But that's such a profound comment, you know, that you said, and that was one of our points. And I took it out because there's so many and mm -hmm. I want to answer questions. We have a ton of questions, but fear is the great deterrent to success. Living in fear. All three of us conquered fear. You know, Alex did it earlier than me and Mike probably did. You know, credit to him. He's got good mentors. But seriously, mm -hmm. fear is the great deterrent to success in life. Your thoughts on that, Mike? Yeah, I would like to hear definitely from Alex more on that overcoming fear. Yeah, that, that started. I mean, this is this is you know this is going past past quite a back number of years. But that started when when I was when I was arrested when I was eighteen and I was incarcerated my 
my first summer of college. That was, that was my summer of college. You know, my first summer <laughs> of being incarcerated. The best um, lesson ever, dude. The best lesson. Yeah, you know, it, it was though because yeah, it was you know, it wasn't like I, I don't say like oh, I was an ex con. Like it was two months, and there's obviously men that do their whole lives. So I mean, two right. months is not anything in that regard. Right. But when you're with a situation I was in where you're around men that are not even career criminals, but let's just say like this, like life, you know, career fuck ups. And you see people where their whole existence, you know, from the time they were a young man up until today is just paranoia and it's being a victim of something and it's self persecution. And, you know, you know what, what no one ever really talks about with, with cr criminality aside from, you know, like the, you know, there's all these predisposed factors, but th there's this level of self loathing. Yeah. This extreme level of self loathing. Yeah. You know, everybody on a certain level just really like they hate their lives, they hate who's around them. It, and it's like extremely, it's a, it's a male environment where everybody's at each other's throats. Um, and you see that play out. Yeah. The, of the course of, you know, guys who are, you know, they've been in and out 10, 20, 30, 40 years. That's, that's their whole life. Their whole life is li living in the, the state of like, what if, what, what's going to happen next? And the, the, somebody's always out to get them. Someone's going to fuck them over. Yeah. And you, if you think like, you know, that gets romanticized sometimes the idea of being criminal, like, Oh, you're free. You're free because you, you do what the fuck you want. And like, you don't really do what you want. You do what you you, what you're afraid of, you know, having lashed back out at you. Um, and, you know, so being around that, like, you know, so I'm in that environment and I'm, I'm 18. Obviously your brain's not fully formed. So I'm like, I'm there, I'm pissed off myself. I'm angry. I've got anger at sort of the authorities and the police. Like I got, I got caught, I got found out. And I, I had this breakthrough probably about like four weeks into it. Where I'm like, I can't control anything right now. I can't control when I piss, when I shit, when I eat. The clothes, I, the, my whole environment, like, everything around me, like I, I have no control over any of this. The only thing I have control over, the only thing is my own internal emotional state. So clearly I have somehow gotten myself into a situation where my ability to live my life, where my literal time has been taken from me. I stole it for myself. Yeah. How can I go about changing to make sure that this doesn't happen again? And you know, mindset is like, if, if anything is, is prologue, it's your mindset. Your mindset is your future. Yeah, you know, so that was like that was sort of the beginning of my mind of mindset work, you could call it. like having to deeply reprogram myself. And I went through probably like the last two weeks, a period of time where I would just sit and kind of think and recollect and review my life and emotions I felt about certain things and how I had acted upon those emotions and you know the consequences of those behaviors. And you you can you can establish a timeline. You establish a timeline of how did I get here? Because it wasn't random. Yeah. And that was uh you know, what, eleven years ago. Yeah, it was eleven years ago. And yeah, it wasn't a linear process where I got out. No, I started you know, obviously making money. I got so successful. Yeah, there's you still have to go through all these experiences of up and down. But I never, after that happened, I never blamed anyone but myself for any kind of situation. If something happened that was unfortunate, okay, yeah, I played a role. <laughs> yeah, like again, I, I'm the only I'm the only person that I'm accountable for. Yeah. And when you view life that way, like you accept that, yes, there's an element of fortune and bad things can happen to good people and you can't control that. Like, that's true. That's 100% true. You know, like the, the, Gre the Greeks have a much better understanding of fortune than the modern world do. We, we like to think everything's linear. And it's yeah. not. You know, there's certain elements of causality that you just you can't affect. All you have is yourself. And what seemed to me over time to be the most prosperous way to live is that you have to, you know, this is very fundamental, you have to believe in yourself and that you can do good things. And you have to love your own existence. Right. You have to extract, you know, you, not I would say extract, you have to experience you know, every moment of elation possible and appreciate the quiet moments and appreciate the ups and downs. And if you do that, you have a certain sense of intuition that develops for opportunity, you know, for seeing things, you know, that are possibilities. And, it's just, and also just for finding authentic people. You know, there's people that live their life fearlessly. And it's not, like I said, it's, like I said, it's not a perfect process, but it's honest. And you know that what they're telling you is true because they've lived it. Yeah. And then you also develop a filter, too, that most people don't live that way. Most people live an inauthentic, dishonest life. Right. It's built upon expectations and certainties and avoidance in what they were told or what they someone you know raised them that you need to do this. You need to be that. And everybody kind of scrapes at that invisible barrier of like, I wish I could. I wish I could be myself. Right. I wish I could live life according to how I want to be. And, and there are people that do it like we've all we've done it. Uh, but then everyone else is on the opposite side of that of that wall, and it's and it's a glass barrier. It's, it's the sort of it's invisible wall, and, and it's themselves. It's their mind. Yeah, I think what very well said uh, before you go, Mike. Um, I think you know the, the, the great the ancients have talked about this that you know most men and women, of course, need a dark night of the soul. And your dark night of the soul was going to jail at eighteen. 
you know, and even after that, you know, you've had trials and travails. I didn't yeah. go to jail until I was 40. Right. And I clearly, I could tell a story, but it's not for the show, you know, talking to an inmate and I was only there for five days. I, you know, I didn't have your experience, but you know, Mike, Mike helped me get an attorney. He was involved in the whole thing. But I mean, like I knew being incarcerated again, just for five days, but having the charges, being there, speaking to people, that was when I knew that I was at rock bottom and it was my soul gift to meaning soul, not as a soul, but like my soul um, to, to change and turn around. And, you know, that was my pivot point. And, you know, my life has been amazingly expansive since then. But, uh, you know, the, the, the point, you know, back to what you just said, Alex, is that people have an invisible barrier. And because of society, because of the matrix programming, the slave weight, the wage slave mindset, there's a million ways we could spin it. Just can't crash through that invisible barrier that you and Mike and I know is invisible and really it doesn't there. It's like a self-containing, you know, barrier or force field. And you can easily break free it through it with, you know, positive action, you know, positive words and obviously positive thoughts, but very few people do it. Mike, your thoughts. Or just embrace I, for me, just embrace the pain. There, you right. know, anytime you're people say, Oh, I don't, I'm never afraid of anything. I'm like, okay, then you're just you're living a very boring life where that's just bravado and just, you know, I don't have, to, I don't have time for that. And a lot of times it, it you're just, it's going to hurt. Right. I don't, I, I liken it to like, say, say for example, leg day, right. you know, it's going to suck. There's just no way around it. You can have every on from on, you know, you can look at the big picture. You can say, well, you're, this is great for your back and spinal. You just, it's going to suck. Um, especially if you're younger, because I, you know, I don't do hard leg days anymore. But when you're right. really trying to be a big boy, it's just gonna suck. The so for a lot of times, uh, there's even a mention of that in Gorilla Mindset is, it's just gonna suck. You're gonna go do something, and you're gonna be rejected, maybe, and you're gonna be disappointed, and you're gonna feel deflated. It's going to just be painful, and a lot of times, just you have to embrace it. Or even, yeah, you know, I do a lot, like the Wim Hof breathing. I started that like four years ago. And I can do, you know, the cold water, fine. It's still, it's never fun. I'm never before I jump into the ice, like, oh, I'm so looking forward to this. And there's no tricks because your body physiologically just goes into a state of like shock. Yeah. It only lasts for 10 seconds. Right. You know, because once you, if you don't know, you, you'll like hyperventilate or something or have hypothermia. But if you've done it enough times or you like you've done the cryo chamber, you know, like, okay, you're going to hit a certain threshold and then you're going to break free and you're actually going to feel better. So the pro fasting is like that, where right. if you're on your 20th hour, it's just not fun. Um, right. It just doesn't feel good. But then you get to hour 28 and suddenly you feel right. like you have Ooh, a yeah. godlike emotion or some something happens. Yeah, it's BDNF. Um, just real quick to add to that, and then we'll go on to the next one. A power. And by the way, we're going to take two more points if you guys are okay. Mm -hmm. This one and then multiple income streams, and then we'll, we'll take questions. Are you guys okay with that? Sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. So – just to this point, the fear of death, the fear of a finite like loss of a Mike Cernovich or a Jay Campbell or an Alexander Juan Antonio Cortez, that really is the ultimate basis of the fear reality, right? It's like when you can, you know, through your work, your spirituality, your inner, your inner work, like meditation, contemplation, whatever it is you do, hopefully to connect with, you know, the sources of power greater than us as physical beings, you can get to a point, and I know I'm there, and I'm sure both of you guys are there too, where the fear of death means nothing. Like, I'll, I'll tell you guys this right now. Like, if I literally went home today and I discovered a lump or something, and I went and you know, I had cancer and it was stage four, I, it wouldn't bother me. Because I literally, I mean, would I attempt to survive through? Of course I would. Would I do chemotherapy and radiation and all the other nonsense from sick care? Absolutely not. Right. I would literally be OK with whatever sentence I had, because I know that my energy, my soul, whatever you want to call it, chi, however you look at it, is not going to die because I understand quantum physics. I understand that energy is unyielding and ever expanding and cannot be quashed. And we are all, as Alex already very elegantly said, energetic organisms. These are just shells, husks, whatever you want to call them. You know, a lot of people, including him, believe that we're just dreaming this. This is a lucid dream, right? We're in a simulated reality. Go watch The Matrix now, you know, at, at, at an aware level. 
part one and part two now and see what you see. It's a lot different than watching it back in 1999 and 2002. We're much more advanced as a conscious beings, as conscious beings. But that's what we are. It's like when you can overcome the fear of physical death, okay, meaning who cares? It's a beginning of a new experience. Uh, you know, the ancients said it, it's a change of focus, right? So it's like when you get to that point, then you're going to live a level 10 life because what is going to hold you back? I mean, that's the ultimate end, right? The finite death of your physical meat suit. So if you don't worry or fear that, then why can't you, you know, go on and on and on? I mean, if you guys want to say anything to that, otherwise I'll just kill that. We'll go into reading. You guys want to address that? Now, there's, there's actually, I'll, I'll address that. There's, there's this point I made. So you guys are obviously are familiar with Occam's razor, which is sort of, sort of, yeah. So Occam, uh, yeah, Occam's razor, everyone's familiar with it. Um, you know, so if you do the minimum to get the maximum or at least effective dose or things most obvious, you know, there's lots of ways to phrase it, but yeah, I came up with something like a few years back or maybe it was two years ago. I, call, I called it Cortez's saber where, so Hernan Cortez obviously conquered Mexico, defeated the Aztecs. You know, the, the thing that I found really interesting about that story is that you could try to look at strategically and say, well, he, he got other tribes to join up with them and the Aztecs were unpopular rulers. And, you know, that's why he's able to overthrow them. You know, but the, the actual, you know, practical situation was that he should have died. Like he right. should have shown up in Latin America, in Mexico and been murdered and everyone should have died. And it would have just been forgotten to history. But you know, the thing, if you look at his life and, you know, that was like the crank achievement of it, but he didn't fear dying. The only way he's able to pull off that plan, which if we look at that now, like it's just almost inconceivable to us. You're really, you're getting, you're getting on a boat. You're going to a country that you don't even know if it even exists. So you're going to the edge of the world. You don't know what you're going to find. You don't speak the language. Like it's truly you are venturing into the unknown. There's nothing like that today that a man can do. We don't have any anything that's on that level of being that unknown. But you go into the unknown and you go there and you're going to conquer a land that you've never seen. And somehow that's going to work out successfully for you. It's just, it's absolutely it's preposterous. It's completely preposterous and probable. You're supposed to fail. But he wasn't afraid of being dead. So he gets there and comes up with this crazy plan and he manages to kill the emperor and you know take him captive and ends up killing him kills his forces and he went to the absolute maximum with everything so like when you're in a, an impossible situation the best thing that you can do is to do is to attempt literally the impossible but that's going to require you that you not fear dying because otherwise rationally speaking every sign is going to point to no you're just going to die you're going to die you're going to fail you're going to get stabbed in the back like how, why would you even think this could work you know, if, if he was alive today, he'd rationalize himself out of the situation, but it succeeded. And if you look at history throughout, you know, a lot of historical events of this great men succeeding and becoming immortal and doing something that was a breakthrough, you know, for human consciousness, for, you know, for humanity, it's those kinds of situations. You know, it's go, it's doing what is supposed to be impossible. You know, which you, you, it's doing what you should never even think to approach. You know, in, in modern life today, we don't have to worry about anything killing us, honestly. We have very few risks. There's very few dangers, unless you really want to put yourself into this a dumb situation um, on that level. Yeah, so what's stopping us now? What's stopping anybody now? Yeah, fear of death? Yeah, yeah, fear fear of change? Like, it, I don't... Yeah, there's lots of things that I've, I've struggled with you know, on a daily basis, like Mike said, where it's like, all right, this could be totally a fuck up, and this might not work out at all, and I'm uncomfortable with this. But what's the worst thing that's going to happen? Right. You know, am I going to die? No. Then, then what's the big deal? Honestly. Right. No, it's absolutely We're hardwired. Hard we're hardwired for fear, though. We are, are that we're still lagging. We're still lagging behind, though, with the the way the world is and what we evolved or how we are programmed to be. And there's I, I read I read a great book called What It Takes, which was about the presidential election that involved people who grew up in the Great Depression and has very vivid descriptions of the Dust Bowl, right? The Dust Bowl for yeah. me was, mm. you, you read about that in some stupid class in eighth grade, the Great Depression. No, the Dust Bowl was so bad that you could be in your house and you were still breathing in yeah. uh, dirt and yeah. mud and muck. Yeah. People were dying of everything. Even in Africa, they're dying of uh, malaria. There, There was an article that it seemed like it overstated it, but it said, you know, half the world's population was dead to mosquitoes. Yeah. That, that's probably not accurate, um, and, but it's directionally true, which is we live in the, in the West. Man, I'm not wondering if I'm going to go outside and mosquitoes going to bite me. Yeah. That's it for me. I'm going to have, you know, debilitating sickness, debilitating flu. Or you, you watch 
even old military history movies or something about how violent the world was. Right. You'd be in a village and they, the Vikings come in or whatever, the Danes come in, how the Danes were fighting with the, the Anglo-Saxons. And everything was just always about conquest and killing you. And that's why we've we've now and we're seeing this now where where everything is getting better in a way because you have time to compound. Think about how much time was lost historically in humanity because we're just so busy killing each other that all of our minds are about, okay, how can we kill people better or how can we not be killed by people better instead of how can we all level our consciousness? And that's where people are operating as fundamental, fundamentally survival mode. Oh no, I'm afraid of this thing. It might kill me. Well, yeah, a hundred years ago, it might have, you know, a hundred years ago, absolutely leaving your house might've killed you. But now the thing you're worried about is it's just going to be a little dose of shame is all you're going to feel, a little, little bit of dose of angst. And people have to – but but part, knowing the backstory is important because that's, that helps people contextualize the fear. That's why I always tell people if you, you deal with a lot of fear, then read history. Why? Well, because then you contextualize it or, or just read the book Sapiens. The sheer scope – I've never read a book that – the sh what the heck? robocallers. I've never read a book where it just talked about the sheer scope of human suffering. Yeah. It's it's actually like it's incomprehensible when you read it you're just like okay yeah they he did an example or they talked about a royal family and how many children they had. The 15 year old they had say eight kids. Three of them probably made it. One right. of them dies at eight. Two right. Can you imagine the the immense mm -hmm. suffering? That you would, and people go, oh, it was different back then. They knew they were going to die. Come on. Your kid so dying yeah. was never, never an easy thing where you didn't wail. Go read the Bible, you buffoons. That's how you tell when people think they're like literate and they're not. Yeah. You can read about when da King David's child died. He, you know, ripped his garments off and the tr traditions people would have, even if we're telling him it was high. And then you realize, okay, so that's why I'm afraid to just do some little bullshit thing. Because up until recently, it was rational to live in fear. Right. Because one wrong right. move, offending the one wrong royal person, right. they'll rape your kids in front of you. It's just over. And now you still have all of that, but you realize that that's not consistent with the world that we live in. And then it makes a lot of the fear realize, okay, now I know why this is happening and I can just kind of set that aside for now. Well, I mean, very well said. So there's two more discussion points and I'll make them together. So the power of reading books. And then the other one is the power of multiple income streams. And I'll, I'll go and then I'll go to cross to Alex and, and you can finish, Mike. Um, so obviously I'm a huge reader. All of these guys are. You can't be anyone in the world unless you learn from the past. You learn from the ancients. You learn from the great teachers and thought leaders of human society and human history. So, you know, I totally every single year for the last five years have not read less than 70 books. I got to 77 this year. I'm actually attempting to get to 78 by tonight, but I don't think it's going to happen because I have family coming over. Um, but, you know, whether it's you read, you know, like us, six plus books a month, or you're somebody who doesn't read at all and you're just attempting to do one, I implore you to read. There's so much that can be learned from reading. And, you know, a lot of people are going to say, well, I read the internet, you know, and I read Drudge Report or whatever. And, and that's not reading. Okay. That's just consuming news that may or not be true or true or false. So again, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of reading. There's so many things that reading can do. I would urge you guys to go to like Ryan Holiday's newsletter. You know, he sells a book now or sells some sort of a program. It's actually cheap and affordable online. That can I get to go, gentlemen. Daughter, daughter woke up from a nap. Shauna was supposed to be home, but got delayed. So great talking to everybody. Thanks for everything. Awesome, Mike. We'll Bye, talk Mike. to you later. Take care. Um, see, that's what happens, right? You have parents. I mean, you got to be a parent. He's got to go and be responsible for his daughter right now. It's life. That's the way it is. He gave us an hour. It was awesome. But, uh, but back to what I'm saying, like reading is so critically important. And again, Ryan holiday has a really good thing. I'm not, I, I don't get paid to support him or say anything. We don't even know each other, but he has a really good course that he can, you know, you can buy for like 10 bucks or something like that. And it can show you how to read and proportion it over one month over month. My other thoughts are multiple income streams. Mm -hmm. Um, it's critically, critically important today in the day and age, in this day and age, even if you are a wage slave, I'm, I know that not everybody has an entrepreneur's mindset. We know that Alex, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not telling you to quit your day job or to quit your, you know, corporate job or whatever it is, but you can definitely have side hustles. 
You can definitely have other ways to make money in your spare time. And I honestly can, I can't stress that hard enough. Like the majority of my life now in the last three years has been built on how do I create more income streams for my family? You know, how do I weather when tough times come? You know, because obviously my wife and I have a residential real estate company that's modestly successful, but how do we have income when real estate is not good or if it co collapses? Because as you know, every market rises and falls. So that's what my focus has been in the last three years. And I've done a really, really good job of building all these things and anyone can do it. You know, it doesn't matter if you have a nine to five. Okay. There's things you can do on the weekend. There's things you can do at night. I mean, my God, the internet, broadband, broadband internet and bandwidth, there's, it's unlimited what you can do. It's just, again, like you said, Alex, like breaking that invisible barrier that you surround yourself in or that the matrix puts around you that says that you can't do it. Your thoughts on both of those points. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with reading, like, it's interesting because I've gone through periods where I've read a lot. I've gone through periods where I've read very little and I've just been sort of in a state of practice. But I've realized the reading, the reason reading is so critical for people is that for those who they are, whether they are, whether they are consciously aware of it or not, but they're locked into this predestined fate as how their life is going to go. And they, they can't think any other way. And, you know, you know, Jay, like most people really sincerely struggle to just think differently. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they have their narrow and a perspective of how they think life is right. according to their own existence. And that's it. And it's, it's hard to grasp anything outside of that. Reading gives you access to other people's lives. So you can retrain your ability to think. You can think multiplicities, multiplicities. You can think multimodal. You can think from multiple perspectives. And that gain, that gain in perspective, that's what allows you to create changes, it creates space to begin changing your, you know, your conscious and unconscious you know, patterns of thought. You know, and, and obviously your actions as well. You can learn from other people's examples. Yeah, and then you know, there are subjects where you can argue that you don't really need to read too much about them to do them. But you know, for the vast majority of things, the knowledge you have access to through learning from an expert person or just learning from even good fiction, yeah. even good fiction and putting your own life into perspective. I mean, you've, re you've really got infinity at your fingertips. Yeah. So you, you have you have that capability to just utterly change yourself, change your life. Um, and there's no barriers to it. Like there's nothing that stops you from doing that. Yeah, I don't necessarily believe that there's any you know, critical book that everybody needs to read, but everyone should have the inclination to want to consume and subsume information or, you know, subsume stories, essentially, you know, some, some you know, taking these energy patterns, you know, to ingest this and let it transform you, you know, let it absolutely transform you. You know, that I've only read a few books on entrepreneurship the last few years. Um, I know launched by Jeff Walker. Sure. I, re I read part of persuasion uh, or influence by Cialdini. But um, yeah, I mean, the thing that really changed my mindset, you know, going back to 2013, 14, I remember me reading Sir Rich's blog. Yeah. And that was before he, he ever got like the affiliate. This is at the beginning stages of like him trying to affiliate market and right, right. create multiple income streams and these things. And obviously he was a lawyer and he worked with wealthy people. You know, he's, he's been exposed to that. But yeah, it got me or this way thinking differently of like, okay, what am I capable of doing? Like, how do we, how do I, how can I create these things? Um, and the, the way the world has changed now, that's why I've, I've said this so many times, especially the younger guys. Uh, you know, young guys, young girls, but you can't rely on a set path anymore. You can't rely on a job. Uh, no, no. You are, there being a career where like, this is the safe career. What, what do you think the best career right. to go into? Right. I don't think there's any best career to go into. What you need to do is view life as a, an accruance process of skills. You need to take, you need to accrue skills. You need to, you know, learn these basic things, being able to read, write, speak, uh, you interact with people, communicate, and then you need to go find what's useful. Then you need to go find something that's meaningful to you. You need to find something that you're good at and you need to find something you can get paid for and see where these things intersect. And then you need to develop sort of, you know, I want to say, uh, you know, like, you know, say like side hustles, but you need to develop multiple ways to apply that skill set because the reality is that technology is going to keep changing and the digital and physical world, they're going to keep changing and merging with each other. Nothing is going to stay the same. And you are, you're, you're, you are not going to have any safety in relying upon doing only one thing and that, that your job, your career is always going to be there for you. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. I mean, I, you, I, you can't, I mean, if you want to add anything to that, I mean, I don't, I don't think you can spin it any better than that. I think at the end of the day, you know, I've said this, I did a really, you know, highly indexed podcast with Mike and mm -hmm. Jim Brown a long time ago. And we talked about the, the reality of being a wage slave, right? The reality of being a wage slave is, is that you, and again, I've lived this, 
you can become a literal senior executive, senior vice president, mm -hmm. and you're still at the end of the day making four fifty a year salary, another buck fifty in bonus. You know, making five to fifteen grand a year, and you are still nothing ever, ever more than that employee ID number on that company payroll. That's it. It doesn't matter what your accomplishments. Again, your business card, what it says is your title. You are never more than that employee ID number. And all it takes, and you know this, Alex, especially in all the corporate world of today, every three to four years, the regimes that run corporations change. Oh, yeah. And so if you're not you know, in that puppet regime, they're going to find a way to get rid of you, especially if you're a highly compensated person. So understanding that, Regardless of whether you're watching this right now and you're 55 and you are that corporate wage slave as a senior VP or you're a 24-year-old kid who's like, you know, starting the game, recognize there are other ways to make money in your spare time. And that's where your focus should be because, like you said, I mean, you can literally be launched and lose your job in an instant. And, you know, we didn't talk about this today and I'll just leave this and then we'll jump into the questions. But um, as you know, technology is literally obsolescing things in three days, three weeks, three months, entire industries of scale mm -hmm. are being decimated because of technology. So it doesn't really matter what your skill set is, especially if you're an older aging person and you've been a success, quote unquote, with that title for so long in your industry, your industry could go away, right? So again, find other ways to make money and do it in your spare time. And you know, don't think that you can't do it because of that invisible barrier. Um, but I mean, again, I, I don't think that if you are a forward thinking person, you should have any, God bless you. You should have any more focus than considering or, or creating other income streams for your family. And, you know, this applies to your kids, you know, right, Alex? Because like both mm -hmm. Alex and Gabby are 10 and 12 now, or Alex will be 12 in less than a month. Gabby's mm -hmm. 10. Mm -hmm. And I am telling them, and Mike knows this too, but I am telling them that college is a bust. Right. Unless one of them wants to be a doctor or a lawyer, I'm not, you know, you're not going to go to school. I'm not going to finance you for $350,000, you know, so that you can go and get a bullshit degree in four years. Now, if you get a scholarship or something else, maybe it's different, but I want both of them to have a, a profitable business by the time they get out of high school. Mm -hmm. Right. So start something at eighth or ninth grade. I'll help you. I'll finance whatever. And I want you to prove to me that you can make a profitable business in four years, whatever it is, online. It could be a fucking car washing business, a lemonade stand. I don't care. Show me that you can make money. And then I'll allow you to potentially, or I'll potentially, Monica and I will finance you to go to college. But I mean, yeah. again, these kids today, as you know, college is a bust. I mean, most of these kids come out of school permanently in debt, permanently in debt. I mean, mm -hmm. hopefully in the golden age, you know, they'll, they'll allow uh, student loan debt to go to bankruptcy because for most kids, that's the best option. They can't get out of it, as you know. I, I, I hope so. I mean, the thing that just kills me with college now, I mean, college, the idea of a university is not a stupid idea. It's supposed to be a place of learning and you come out, you know, a smarter, wiser person. But the modern university today, I, I, I can't endorse it. It's just a shit show. Yeah, you can always Absolutely. argue, well, there's a few industries, well, doctors, obviously lawyers, engineers. Yeah. But I, I would probably estimate 80% of kids getting de degrees today is just utter fucking garbage. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's indoctrination. It's woke bullshit. It's, it's, it's left, it's leftism. It's cultural Marxism. You know, it's, you're, you're training young people's brain. You're, you're taking young people and you're training their brains to be ineffective. And they have no idea of how to create value for anyone, which is what kind of like, what says what a job is. They, so they don't know how to create value. They don't know how to be valuable. They don't know how to recognize value. They have no sense for opportunity. They lack work ethic. And they come out of these situations and, you know, they have this debt, obviously. Uh, you know, what's their future? What do they do? Yeah, like, there, there is no future. And they, they have no sense of how to even create a future for themselves. Right. Yeah. But then at the same time, at the same time, you have these entrepreneurial young people, these kids where, like, it really impresses me when I see the younger guys trying to make money, you know, even if it's, you know, maybe, maybe they're messing up and trying to fake it even a little bit, but they actually are looking at the world and thinking objectively, like, you know what, what's an opportunity where I right. can put myself in the middle of a flow of money, you know, like because the value is always flowing somewhere and I can try and capture some of it and I can try and create a business. And you, know, you don't have to be 30 to think that way. You can start thinking that way at 15, at 12. Like you don't need, you don't need to be an older person to recognize where there's opportunity. 
Yeah. You don't, you don't need to be, you don't. Flat out, you do not. You can learn that from a very young age. Yeah, very, very well said. Okay, are you good for about 15 minutes to answer oh, yeah. questions? Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. So, guys, um, if you're watching right now, first off, there's about 100 people watching. We really appreciate you guys watching this. I think there's been some profound um, insights shared by all three of us. Uh, obviously, Mike had to go. <laughs> you know, he's a parent, man. I mean, I was there. He's got two little girls just like I did. If Sean is not there, he's got to run and be dad. So, you know, love Mike and thanks for him for showing up. It was awesome. Um, you guys know how to get a hold of him, Cernovich.com, find him on Twitter. I mean, you know, Mike doesn't need an introduction. Um, so so I got a bunch of questions from guys here. So, guys, I'm um there's a lot. Um, so I'm scrolling through them. Um, I will put them up if I think it's really good. Um, I see Josh. What's up, Josh? I feel people have the opinion have to have opinions to help them feel secure of the world around them. That's a very, very good point. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very good point. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, but one reason I stopped drinking in college was because it affected my performance in the gym. I'm, I'm attempting to find questions here too. Um, I did see somebody who read a really made a good point. Uh, hold on one second. Let's see. Uh, some of us are the type of fish that will eat themselves to death if there's enough food. <laughs> All right, Greg. Good comment. It's funny. Uh, obviously, self-control. Um, there are no obstacles, only stories you tell yourself. So if you can't have the things that you really want, absolutely true. Um, Jarrett is, uh, says fancy dinner, great experience, pretty lady to celebrate tonight for New Year's Eve improvement all this past year and looking to thrive even more. Thanks guys. Okay. So here's a good one. You can answer this, Alex. Um, do any of you three adhere to the notion that being successful has been harder for women than men due to our patriarchal society? Answer that. I'll be right back. No, honestly, I think that's utter bullshit. Um, you could argue that sixty years ago, when uh, you know there was there were women that worked in certain fields, and obviously there was an old boys network, and you know keep the girls out. But in the modern environment today, I mean, if you look at every metric from you know, collegiate degrees to earning income to this, uh, you know, this health, mental health, um, you know, from a school age, I'm just I'm kind of running through stuff in my head. I mean, girls outperform boys in literally everything now. Everything. You go to big cities like New York, it's very common for women to earn more than men um, in any kind of job. You know, the wage gap is, is bullshit. You know, men and women get paid exactly the same. Uh, you know, the reason why it even, the reason why there's a gap is because women tend to take more vacation time than men or maternity leave. But uh, I, I don't think being successful is harder at all. If anything, it's a lot easier because people like people like to help women. Men like to help women. Um, you know, maybe women don't like to help women, but I, yeah, I can I couldn't point to anything like, oh, this is definitely be a real obstacle. Yeah, and even the obstacles that exist, you know, supposedly like, oh, there, there's there's sexism. Like, I don't take any of that seriously. A lot of it's just women being extremely, extremely hypersensitive to men that are dorky. Uh, so, no, no. If anything, it's easier, and you actually have a lot of advantages. You have a lot of advantages being a woman over being a man. Yeah, you know, men tend to get marginalized that way. Um, in a lot of ways. So if, if you're, if you're I, I think I don't mean to cut you off, but I think I, everything you said, I listened to it. By the way, I had to go to the bathroom. Nature called. Sorry about that, guys. But uh, yeah. it's not true. Women still have all the power. They've always had all the power. You know, this feminism nonsense. And again, I'm not attempting to offend people. I'm just saying as a point of fact is like just silly. It's just, as you know, you know, Dr. Napoleon talked about it. So in so much of a greater fashion when he said that it was really just a way to get women as wage slaves and paying taxes. There was no other motive behind it. You know, all this give women more power. Women have always had the power. <laughs> you guys have that, you know, thing down there that men want and you have control over that. So um, I love Wendy. And, you know, I, I agree with you what you said, though. Um, I think it's a mindset. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the issue with women, this is getting like, this gets into like female psychology, honestly. Like, why do women not succeed the way men do? Women don't think they deserve success a lot of times. Or not even success, they don't think they deserve to like be treated nicely. Yeah, I, I've seen this in so many environments where it's not that the women get treated like, oh, it's misogyny. I'm like, it's not misogyny, it's just women won't speak up. They won't say anything. They, like, they'll be so uns unsure of themselves to even express an opinion um, and then when they try to do that because of their uncertainty, because it's done this so weakly, honestly, they're not taken seriously. It's like, oh, well, they, it's, they're oppressing me. You're not being oppressed. You're just not representing yourself properly. You know, men by by default are much more forceful. So, right. I mean, there is some, there is definitely something to the fact that if you want people to take you more seriously as a woman, especially in, in business and corporate world, all that shit, you have to act more like a man. 
you know, the trade off is that you then have to act more like a man. Uh, so, you know, is that worth it to you? Like, do you enjoy being that way? Maybe yes, maybe no. Yeah. I mean, exactly. So Wendy also has a good follow-up comment to that. Um, and by the way, Mitch had a really good comment. I'm sorry. I just cut him off. So he said, yeah. when you point the blame elsewhere, you make yourself a victim. When you take ownership of your situation, you take control to change it. Love this message. Um, you know, that's, that was one of the bullet points that we also took off, which was the two boilerplates of consciousness, right? Which mm. we kind of already hit on it with, with the, you know, getting to 500 level. But the bottom line is there are two types of consciousness. And you know this, and you've written probably 50 emails in the last two years about it. But mm. those, those people who are sovereign, empowered, me and you, we take ownership. Every fucking thing that happens is our fault. doesn't matter. No. It, we got, you know, run over in the street or somebody rear-ended rear us and our, it was our back. It's still our fault. We take ownership for things that happen to us, even those that are outside of our control. And that's the 15%. And then you have 85% of society, which is literally like my mommy and daddy didn't love me enough. I didn't graduate with a 3.5 in college. I went to a shitty high school. I mean, it's constant. Somebody else is to blame. And then it's the assigning of the blame, right? And then it's when those type of people, and again, it's a victim mindset, victim mm -hmm. mindset, when they do finally pull themselves up by the bootstraps, Alex, what do they do? They find the savior. I'm going to follow Alexander and Jay because they're the gurus online and they know everything. Instead of listening to themselves and realizing that they are the great arbiter of their destiny. It's unbelievable how people literally are victims on one hand. And then when, again, they start to seemingly make the shift, everything goes into the guru. And dude, you know, right now, right? Like online and internet today, that's where we're at. People literally want to put their focus and their attachment to the guru. The guru said, Alex, I mean, Mike was talking about it in the podcast earlier, right? Like people, yeah. instead of listening to one guru, they won't even take that guru's evidence without one week going by listening to another guru. <laughs> yeah, so well, it, the savior it, complex. Yeah, it's this thing. It's like it's people have they, they, people are in this process of wanting a search for truth. Like I need to go find what's true, what works. Okay, like we we can respect that. Yeah, I, but I remember when I was you know coming up in the gym, like just you know when I started lifting weights, teenager. I would read something and I just go try it, and it maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. But you just you just assess it. And I didn't have a personal relationship with like, oh, this guy said this and he's the one that has, you know, like the holy grail of like, you know, the ultimate, you know, highest truth in the world. I'm like, I, that's not how I viewed it. I'm like, all right, this guy said this. Let's see it. All right. Maybe it worked. Maybe it didn't. All right. Cool. Whatever. It wasn't, it was nothing personal. I wasn't looking for a Jesus Christ figure to lead right. me to the promised land of, you know, like the, the true, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the true reality. But what, what you see today with this guru shit online is, I mean, people, one, they position themselves this way of like, I have all the answers, but then people too, they want to put all their faith and all their entitlement and all their ego and all their um, you know, identity into an authority figure. And this person will be the person that sort of saves me, that, show, that shows me this pathway. Exactly. Um, yeah. And that's me. I just I always try to discourage it. That's why I make, I'm so irreverent oftentimes with like my social media where I don't want you got yeah. I, I'm always very encouraged if yes, people follow me. I hopefully I set some kind of good example, but you need to decide what's right for your own life by way of your own being. Exactly. I can't do that for you. I have no answers that way. I can pose questions, and hopefully that question helps you find what your answer is. You already said it, dude. You said, which was again to me the most profound statement in this whole podcast. That if anyone watches this and takes this, it's love and trust of self. Mm -hmm. If you love and trust yourself, you can discern what Alex, what Jay, what Mike, what any online guru tells you and know in your heart to be true. Right? Right. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, you know, I, Jay, I miss a funny point. I, I had a guy recently, I don't know who it was since I blocked him immediately, but I, I posted something like probably two, three weeks ago. I'm like, here's like the top five, probably most effective exercises for each muscle group. Like you do these things and like they work really well. And I gave an example, like you want, Bigger biceps, you want big forearms, like start doing hammer curls. You do hammer curls, do 10, 20 reps. As you, the weight gets heavier, your arms get bigger over time. Yeah, I mean, it's just basic, right? That's as bro as it gets. But, you know, there's progressive overload. Yes. And this, this guy, some guy comments, he's like, well, you know, I, he's on, like, he, he linked to somebody on YouTube. Well, this guy on YouTube says that this is the best exercise. So, like, what do you think of that? Because he doesn't agree with you. I'm like, I'm, I'm reading this. I'm like, how, how, the, how the fuck do you even set this premise? You read something. 
which is just a generic recommendation. You go find something that contradicts it, like you think, or something that says different. You create this contradictory argument, and then you want me to reply to your argument as to why this person thinks I'm wrong, so why you think I might be wrong, and I'm supposed to def defend myself against this, I don't know, this accusation. I'm like, this is, it's just, it's, well, it's such bullshit, but it highlighted this epidemic of like brotardation and guru worship to me of like, how, how about you just think for yourself? How about you try a thing and see? You know, like, how do you go through life thinking this way where you're constantly comparing your, your prophets, so to speak, and who is yeah. the, you know, who is the most hallowed of prophets and who is the one supposed to follow them? Like, your, your existence is going to be so fucking futile if that's how you operate. Alex, honestly, you guys both said it earlier. Um, it's the, it's technology. It's, it's basically giving people avenues that they didn't have in the past. The ancients didn't have this. The ancients followed one path or one master or one guru and then stuck to it, right? Mm -hmm. Consistently, rigorously adhered to that philosophy. And oh, by the way, in 10 years, you see amazing results and then you're not searching. But today, technology gives all these like you said, bro scientists, bro tards, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. you know, forums. And then people who lack, you know, love of self and trust of self read that and then they get lost and confused. And that's unfortunately where we are, you know, today. Brian McMaster says really good thing, which I agree with 100%. And also, Wendy, I'm going to publish, I'm going to post what you said because she said something after to follow up. Yeah. And I love Wendy. Wendy's an amazing, but um, that right there. So strong women are awesome. Men, as Alex has written a million times before, do get weird around attractive women because, again, they don't trust themselves. They don't love themselves. But Wendy says something here. Alex, this is the answer when you no. were answering. Women are ostracized when they speak up and then other women hating other women who are successful. That's the problem for women. Women literally victimize themselves. And again, it goes back to the emotionality aspect of women hating on another woman doing well. I mean, listen, you know this, right? Like if you, you know, and obviously my wife is a very beautiful woman, mm -hmm. a very powerful woman too, right? So she attracts the haters. There are a lot of women oh, yeah. that are like Monica. Bah. So it's like, but the reality is, is that when, when a woman is successful, she's going to have haters. She's going to have victims. She's going to have people that want to, you know, pull, you know, crabs in a bucket, right? Pull her down, get into that group. So it's like, Wendy, the answer is like, you know, find powerful, amazing women to be in your circle, you know, that, that can influence you. And that, and that's where you go and that's where you congregate. Cause it is true. I mean, you know, my wife is very open about this. She doesn't have a lot of friends that are women because yeah. women really do be or like to be crabs in a bucket. They really <laughs> do. Oh, they are. I mean, you know, Preeti is talking about this too, my girlfriend. But you know, Wendy, to your point, like, I mean, here, I'll, I'll, I'll change my mind about this. She makes a good point that when you're over fifty, um, yeah, you know, you're trying, you're trying to find a job. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. You're from over fifty. I mean, here, this is the harsh reality, and this is you know, one of the, one of those th this the modern problems of the modern world. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say that women should never work, but the modern environment, what we favor, or just just the, the realities of the working environment. If you're an older person you're an older man over 50, you're an older woman. Time is not on your side. You don't like, you know, young women have power because they have beauty, you know, but to be beautiful is also to experience loss. Exactly. When you're a beautiful woman, unless, unless you really cultivate and take care of that for a long time, which you should, you're not going to be at an advantage if you've aged right. and you, if you right. let yourself go. And even if you are beautiful, let's say you are a beautiful woman and you, you try to be a force of nature, other women are going to fucking hate you. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And there is some, there is some reality to the idea that are are men intimidated by by you know beautiful powerful women? Yeah, it's not so much intimidation as it just as not knowing how to deal with it. Yeah, and yeah, that's you know that's, you could say that's on the part of the man, the part of the woman. But I mean, it's yeah. I, I my hope would be in a, in a good society that you don't need to be old. You know, if you're a woman, you're older than fifty. Hopefully, you have a husband. You're being taken care of. You have to work. But if you do have to work, like I just said, you, you really have to be this like a force of nature unto yourself, right? Yeah, because you're not going to get support from your sex. No, you're you're likely getting support from men. It, it's really going to de depend upon your ability to be like charming, persuasive, and you're going to have to endure the barriers almost of like you're kind of almost going to experience what men go through when men get older and they're trying to reinvent themselves. You're just going to be fucking invisible to people. Yeah, and that's something that you know, like I mean, this is you know, this is like a, the female comparison where I don't think it's ever quite. It, it's hard for women to understand this, but if you're an older man and you're trying to like you know reinvent your life, 
and you don't have much going for you, nobody gives a fuck about you. Right. Like you're you're dead to everyone. You're right. dead. To, nobody cares. No one cares. Like nobody cares about you. I um, mean, that's you know that for men that can just be just heartbreaking because you just realize you're just kind of irrelevant to most human beings. You know, women don't care about you. Other men don't care about you. You have nothing to offer anybody. So, like, you're really going out alone in your journey that way. Um, you know, I mean, what's this, what's the solution there? Uh, you know, I mean, it's just you're going to have to suffer a bit and just endure sort of the pain of rejection. But, like I said, you're going to have to make yourself into somebody where reality can't deny you. Right. I mean, not, nothing more can be said about that. I mean, honestly, guys, like, you know, Wendy, I, I read your other comment, too, about your daughter. Um, you know, she wrote uh, my youngest daughter right here. Look, I mean, my third year of college, she changed her major to journalism, has no great goals or ideas. She's just taking required classes. I mean, that's a perfect example of why we say that college, especially if you're fi- funding that or financing that, or she is, and she's taking on college debt, mm-hmm. there's really no winning sol- situation or scenario that comes out of that. Because as you know, Alex, the university systems now are progressive indoctrination camps. And I don't want to go down a political diatribe. We're not going to discuss that. But yeah. We all know that they teach a slavery mindset. They yeah. teach indebted servitude. They teach a go work for the man. You know, they, they, they don't want, they just want more people coming to college, getting in debt. That's all they want. That's literally the goal of university state. I'm not saying that you can't go and become a doctor, attorney, blah, blah, blah. But the majority of people go to school, get a four-year liberal arts degree, come out of school, 250 to $300,000 in debt. And that's with state schools and they're done. I mean, you can you know, figure the compounded interest only payment mm-hmm. on a $300,000 student debt right now. And I know what it is. It's literally $27.50 a month. Who the fuck coming out of college when you factor in another at least $2,000 a month in, in, in livable wages? And that's not California, as you know, Alex. You couldn't live on $2,000 a month in California. No. I mean, you'd you'd have transportation. You'd be you would, scraping by. It, it, it barely, right? So that's. That's five thousand dollars a month, right? With uh, going to college, right? When you come out, I mean, there are nobody. And again, hello, why are all these kids living in their parents' basements? I mean, that's where we're at. So, if you're a younger guy and you've watched the show, a younger woman, you've watched the show, and you know you are in college or are contemplating going to college, just make sure you're doing the right thing, you know, because it doesn't pencil. It really doesn't pencil. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I, you, I don't know if you read the, the the Afghanistan papers and like the Washington Post, yeah, which is which is a great thing. If you want, to, if anyone wants to read something that really to dive deep on a subject, oh, it's amazing. You, yeah, you can read that. It's like six parts. It takes a while to read, but it just it illuminates just the complete uh, complete scam that was the, uh, the Afghanistan war on terror. Right. But that that was done to the tune of about like a bill a trillion dollars, something like that. And if you look at the total student debt right now, it's about one point five trillion. And I think about that a lot. I'm like. Yeah, what would finance that war? I'm like, it was probably just, it was literally kind of student loans. It was the magic of student loans. It was because you owe the federal government money and you're going to have to pay that back. And if they have your debt, well, that gives them debt to pay for their things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, nothing, I can't say anything more about that. We can go on this for a while, but like for everyone listening, yeah, if you have young kids and they're in college, try to encourage them to take a better path. Or, and if they are in college, get done as fast as possible. Yeah, otherwise, I mean, it, God bless them, but they're just going to be at an immense disadvantage. Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. Um, so final point, because I'm getting a bunch of guys talking about it, and we it was one of the points I just didn't put it up there, and I'll just do it because it's just me and you now. Mm. And we're both we're both fitness bros. Um, it's the last one, and we'll both say it, and then we'll end the show. Um, the importance of being remaining metabolically flexible, you know, and how it trumps all diets, right? And yeah. and I wish me and Alex were this smart. This is all Charles Poliquin. You know, Charles Poliquin literally said in the late 80s and early 90s, if I'm going back uh, correctly, and you know this, right? Like no thought, nothing new under the sun, right? Mm -hmm. Like he said that you get your carbs when you deserve them. And the reality of maintaining metabolic flexibility is that if you think that any specific diet is the best diet, when we've already debunked it by saying that we're all N of one, then you're never going to ever find success in any kind of rigid, you know, dietary process. And, and, and again, and Alex can clear this up if I'm not clear, but I don't care what you do, right? Like obviously Alex and I are big fasting believers. We understand the processes of senescence and autophagy. 
We understand that from a life extension purpose, there's nothing better. It's a cellular fumigation, right? So fasting is amazing, right? We know that the ancients fasted, the mm -hmm. great spiritual gurus fasted. We know it works, as you said earlier. Oh, yeah. If it's been working for it's, it's, it's Lindy. It, it, it's tried and proven by God knows how many years. For of history. years, it probably works, right? So I will just say this: like metabolic flexibility really means, and I write about this in my my newest book that's out now, five months. God, dude, time fly, is flying now. But uh, <laughs> it, it's basically allowing your body to fuel itself based on its unique energetic demand, right? So if you're a bodybuilder. It's a good factor to think that if you're young and you want to build muscle, you're going to need carbohydrates, right? To replenish mm -hmm. muscle glycogen, to give you fuel for training, to hit the three different energy systems, which we're not going to get into. If you're a, um, an endurance athlete, maybe an ultra triathlete or a, a marathoner or something, then yes, look into ketogenic, right? Because we know that when you use fats to fuel energy sources, you can actually probably have more endurance. Again, debatable, but there's merit and science to it. So the bottom line is, is that relative to what you're doing in your life, that's how you should fool your body. And again, I fast. I also eat carbs on the days that I don't train. So again, mm -hmm. I'm allowing my body to fuel itself based on the energetic demand that it needs relative to my performance. Your thoughts on metabolic flexibility? Yeah, I'll, I'll say this. Since people keep asking like, you know, carnivore diet gets the question constantly. <laughs> if you look at, if here's the thing, the carnivore diet. And you know, I'm going to credit Dr. Jack Cruz. He talks about this too. Um, part of the, a huge unrecognized part of health, human health is light exposure. Exactly. So our bodies are driven by the circadian cycle of the sun. If you live in a, if, if your environment is such where you get actual natural sunlight on a daily basis and you are physically active and your cells are, your, your body's really exposed to sunlight, your mitochondria function better. You digest carbs, carbs better. You sleep better. All of your hormones regulate as they should. So that's how it's supposed to work. The modern environment, you have people where they don't go outside. Their only exposure to light is literally blue light, fluorescent light. They, they don't see the sun at all. And over time, they can become literally metabolically broken because they consume a processed, sugar, carbohydrate-laden diet. They become overweight. So they're, you're metabolically busted. You're screwed up. Now, the carnivore diet, what it allows you to do is it allows you to undo a lot of that damage. So, like, yes, it, obviously it works well for a lot of people. Um, who are, like I said, metabolically just broken in a disease state. Right. If you're not metabolically broken, though, you don't need to be carnivore. Now, you can certainly make a case for maybe you need less carbs. Like, yeah, that, that's reasonable, of sure. Course. Of course. But, you know, the carnivore diet is not sort of this be-all, end-all solution. Yeah. Um, you know, so you have to really put that into perspective. Yeah, and then on the subject of metabolic flexibility, yeah, if you want to build muscle or just, or just perform athletically um, and you want to have the ability to – sustain yourself you know across you know different environments you're going to have to change what you eat and modulate it accordingly um you, you really can't argue with that like that is something that nutritional science has nailed down pretty well like yeah carbs help performance and you know, everything i've seen in the carver diet where people they start you know even losing body fat on it nobody gets buff doing the carver diet they go from being obese to no longer being obese you know maybe they build a little bit they build some muscle not that much if you're talking about athletic performance and really like, you know, really want to change your physique and look good, you require carbohydrates. You have to put your, <laughs> you, you have to put your body into a, uh, you know, a, a glycogen positive state, if you want to call it that to facilitate muscle growth. And like that needs to happen like that, that needs to happen. You know? So, I mean, I know this is like a little bit science heavy, but uh, again, there's, there's, there's no Holy grail way to eat that is above all other ways. You, exactly. you have to view things contextually. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, first off, you know, the carnivore diet guy, Dr. Sean Baker, I invited him to come on and debate me. I'm happy to do a podcast with him. Um, you know, he posted his blood work and obviously his A1C and all that stuff. And the guy was like borderline type two diabetic and he had low testosterone. And again, he's a freak of nature. He's very strong. I have nothing against Sean. He's obviously an accomplished surgeon here in San Diego, yeah. but it's not supportable. Okay. Neither is, you know, ketogenic diet only supportable. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all N of one and we're all going to be unique metabolically, biologically, uh, you know, epigenetics affects more than even DNA does. We know that now too. So realistically, you have to experiment on yourself. If you are a 55 year old man or woman and you're more obese, yes, then lowering your carbohydrate intake by eating only meat, you know, 
um, or fasting and only eating keto style or whatever. Yes, you're going to yeah, drop you're gonna, body you're gonna drop body fat. Yes, you're that will going happen. To drop body fat, but is it the most effective slash efficient way for you as a human being to exist from a performance angle and from all these other factors? Absolutely not. You have to view here the thing with this. I, I mean, I use this phrase literally every day. You, Jay, you know, it's like how often do I use the word continuum? These things, your health operates on a continuum. Your, your training, all these, all these factors, they operate on a continuum. Exactly. So you take account of all these multiple factors, and then at that given stage, relative to your need state, you say, okay, what would be the most optimal way to improve my health? That exactly. might be fasting and very low carb to no carb dieting. Okay. Right. Right now, is that going to change in let's say six months, twelve months, when you've lost the body fat? And now you want to let's say you want to build muscle, you know, because you, you need to build muscle. Uh, yeah, you know, let's say that you're you've stabilized your hormones now, and you actually have the capacity to utilize glycogen and utilize blood sugar. Okay, well, you can start doing that. Exactly. So, you know, a diet is not a fixated thing where it stays the same forever. Someone asked about the the one meal a day. Oh man, it's eating one meal a day. It's it's caloric restriction by way of meal restriction. There's there's nothing fancy about that. Exactly. Like you, like you have to get this. Like you guys have to understand this stuff. The, the reason diet work diets fundamentally work is because they change how your body operates metabolically, and they also will help to create a calorie deficit, either that's internally or externally measurable. You can kind of argue the the biodynamics of that. I'm not going into that, but you're going to have to create some sort of energy deficit in the body and change the way your body utilizes energy. If you only eat one time a day, can you overeat? No. There's no <laughs> how. how? That it's 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 physically I think I don't say physically I don't think it's impossible but it is highly improbable that you're going to overconsume food if you only eat one time a day. So why is what do you think of OMAD? Yeah, it's going to create a deficit. You're going to lose weight. That that's what will happen. Well, I mean, again, too, and you already know this, right? Like if you go 16 to 18 hours before you're eating, you've turned on the metabolic cascade again mm -hmm. of senescence of autophagy. You are increasing, you know, uh, fight or flight hormones. You're doing all the things that fasting does to increase cellular turnover. And obviously, again, do a fumigate, fumigation of your biological system. So, of course, one meal a day is great. Now, obviously, I could see, um, you know, there are some examples where if a person, and again, this is a very rare outlier exception, if the person was morbidly obese and yep. they still somehow, you know, throw down 4,500 calories at, yeah, yeah. at night. And then, oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, ultimately, it's not going to be a bad thing if you eat, you know, a reasonably caloric uh, meal at 7.30 or 8 o'clock night after fasting for 16, 18, 19, 20 hours or whatever, if you eat one time. So, the, you know, the one meal a day diet, I think it makes sense. But again, everything, as you said, is contextually relevant. So, dude, mm -hmm. I think this has been epic. Um, how can people reach you or work with you if they want to reach out to you right now? Oh, so I, I mean, you guys, I think the majority of you know, uh, the website, the email list, newsletter, the best place to find me, sign up. Um, I don't have any links to share right now since we're in the process of getting them together. I got two things coming this month for everybody that's watching the broadcast. I have a course coming with uh, Tanner Guzzi in Atlantmore that's a mindset, bot, mindset fitness in presentation course. So that's going to be nice. on developing a more powerful mindset building a more powerful body and improving your physical presence, how you dress, how you present yourself. That's being released within the next week. Nice. Um, and then after that, I, in the middle of the month, I am going to have a muscle building group with Josiah. My buddy Josiah, we're going to be opening that up to about 50 people. And that will run for about three months from January through the uh, through March. So those two things are coming. Obviously, you know, follow me on Twitter. That's where I almost announce everything. Follow the newsletter. That's where I announce everything. And hopefully those you guys can make use of those resources this year. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys, for sure, make sure you guys follow Alex on um, Twitter and then, of course, subscribe to his newsletter. It's like literally one of the only newsletters that I read um, on a regular basis. It's really epic content. And uh, most of you guys, I mean, I think most of the people that follow us all know each other. I'm at TRT Expert on Twitter. Um, I'm, my my Twitter feed is heavily suppressed and censored for the things <laughs> that I talk about, uh, as Alex and Mike also know. So if you do follow me on Twitter and you magically unfollow me, <laughs> mm -hmm. Don't be surprised. Um, but, you know, as you know, Alex, I mean, the type of things that, you know, people like Mike and myself and Alex talk about, social media is censoring that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah they are. I mean, there's nothing that any of us can do unless we decide to just delete our social media accounts, which arbitrarily someday may happen. I mean, Alex already experienced that. I mean, it, may, it, may, it may happen. You know, grace of God that I got my account back. But Mike's account, or my, Alex's account for really no apparent reason other than, you know, some sort of nonsense and somehow he was able to get his account back. So, I mean, again, everything is almost algorithmic today. 
and AI based with all the social media. So again, you know, uh, buyer beware. It is what it is. But uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate you guys. If you guys are not following my newsletter, um, I warn you, I send out a lot of emails. I have a really awesome crew that helps me write my emails and sends them out. I do publish my own on Mondays and Tuesdays. It's join.totrevolution.com. Oh yeah, then I'll, I'll share mine. My, so you can find my website. It's just Cortez, C-O-R-T-E-S dot site. Everything's there. There you go. Everything's there. Cortez dot site. That's it. So please, guys, we we appreciate you guys. Obviously, we 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 encourage you guys to follow and consume our content. But uh, thanks for being with us today. Here, we wish mm -hmm. all of you guys an amazing, prosperous 2020. Do not go out and wreck yourself tonight. You know, if you can, <laughs> if you can control that, you know, temper, be temperamental, or actually use temper in your enthusiasm tonight. So again, we appreciate you guys. We will see you guys soon. See you guys in the new year. All right. I think we're about to end.